Uh, thank you folks for joining us tonight. Uh, we have, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, as you might know, our, our talk, as you know, our talk is about solid owl banding and some of the research that's going on up at the Big Chico Creek Ecological Reserve. And tonight we have Ken Sullivan, uh, who is an avid birder, field trip leader, vice president of Altical Audubon Society. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that's in the Chico area and is a Northern California representative on Audubon California Boards of Directors. He has worked with the last 11 seasons volunteering and assisting, and is now the director of the Northern Solid Owl Fowl, Fall Migration uh, Monitoring Project. And in addition, Ken, Ken has been a science teacher and to a middle school students in Oroville since 1995. Uh, he has shared his love of science and birding with his students and both to the classroom and in the field. And uh, I want you all to please welcome uh, Ken uh, here tonight to speak to Yolo Audubon on this saw wet owl work. And uh, it's someday I will have a soul satisfying look of a saw wet owl. And so I'm gonna be prepared by paying attention to what Ken has to tell us. Ken, you're on. Well, excellent, thank you for having me. So thank you for the introduction and I really like when you leave your camera on, at least so I can see a couple faces. So I appreciate those that have their camera on. It helps me as a teacher communicate with my audience. And obviously if you have to cough or whatever, you can um, turn your camera off, but it's nice to see who I'm working with as a teacher. I've spent a lot of time on Zoom. So um, yeah, excellent. So I'm real glad that, uh, that you came. I've um, you know, uh, as Ken mentioned, um, I'm the director of the project and we're working just out of Chico. So I live in Chico, that's home. And um, the project was originally started um, by Don Garcia. So some of you may know Don Garcia. Um, she retired um, from um, research from the OWL project and uh, I've, she kind of handed it off to me. So I've been working with these guys for these owls for what, uh, 10, 11 years. And um, it's, it's such a treat. So when you see these pictures um, and some of the videos and stuff of these, uh, these creatures, they're, they're pretty darn amazing. So we've had field trips in the past. Uh, Central Valley Birds um, has brought a trip up. So maybe we can talk and um, get a trip of people to come up and to, to Chico and come up to the reserve, maybe in the fall when we have the birding or when we're doing the banding. So let me go ahead and share my screen and then we'll get started. Okay, so you should see the screen of the owl. Thumbs up if you see that. See my first page? Yes, thank you. Okay, so this is, uh, this is our owl, the Northern Sawwood Owl. And, um, you know, Ken mentioned that uh, he hasn't had a soul sa satisfying um, sighting of one of these owls. They're actually quite common, um, but uh, they're very elusive and they're very hard to see. Um, uh, they are the most plentiful owl in North America, in North America. Um, and I'll share some range with you a little bit later. But, um, you know, if you think about it, um, you know, one area might have a pair of great horn owls or screech owls. Um, but, you know, some nights we'll have 17 sawwets that just come through our station. And um, so um, now some people are familiar with this tiny owl by this report last year, November um, 2020 that uh, this little solid owl was found in the Christmas tree. So it was hiding in the Rockefeller Christmas tree. So when this news report came up, oh, everyone that I know, my family, they all sent me an article, oh, did you see this owl? You know, so it's least, at least I'm, I'm glad they're paying attention to the uh, species that I work with. Um, so that's probably the most famous solid owl. Now the range, um, the range. So um, year round, they're in the kind of the boreal regions um, or southern part of, of Canada. Um, purple is year round. And 
uh, a blue, um, you know, non-breeding blue and um, the lighter blue, blue is kind of non-breeding or kind of scarce. So this is kind of the range. Um, if you see up in our foothills in the coastal range, um, they're considered year round. So um, not so much in the lower elevations where I do my study. Um, there's, you know, it gets just too hot um, at the reserve. And I'll talk about the reserve in a second. So I'm going to show you that this is a video on the right. Look very closely of this owl, at this owl. So it's neat to see. I don't know if you saw that, that blink or not. Um, but um, they're, these owl, as I mentioned, the most frequently, they are the most frequently banded owl in North America. Um, it's part of Project OwlNet, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the average age of encounter is 1.9 years. Um, the longevity record is nine years and five months. And um, they breathe the Northern Forest Upper Cascades generally from about 4,300 feet in the Cascades and Sierra to about 7,500 feet. So here is a mama um, on um, her nest and look at all the, um, the rodents that she has cached in that box. So it's, it's pretty, pretty phenomenal. I didn't take this picture. Um, I have it. Um, yeah, I, I didn't take this picture. I hope to, um, to have um, Sawwitz nesting in my boxes, but not yet. So uh, the males sing starting early winter, and you might have heard in the last uh, clip, they, they, they sound like a and the males will sing starting early winter. Um, they tend, the males tend to stay on territory and uh, they'll sing. So the females usually choose a nest cavity of whether a pileated woodpecker um, or their flicker nest cavity. Um, Sawwets are cavity nesters, but not roosters. So they won't roost uh, at night or during the day or in, during the day, um, unlike a, a screech owl. So our Western screech owls are the owls that you have down in the valley. Um, I heard one outside the other night in my house in Chico, just uh, down the valley. And uh, those guys will actually, um, they'll uh, roost in a nest box. Um, but these guys only for for nesting, will they use it? Female incubates uh, about five to six eggs, and uh, the male will hunt. And usually, what happens is the female, while the eggs are in the box, the, she'll stay on the eggs, and the male will hunt. And then after they um, after they hatch, then the female will go out and hunt. And um, just before fledging, frequently the female will leave and let the male take it. Um, but they work together. Um, they're typically monogamous, but that's typical. Although the Sawwets have been known to have up to three clutches per, uh, so three nests. So uh, the, the males tend to stay on site. They don't, they don't migrate. Um, and I didn't mention too much about migrating, um, but we will. Our owls are coming from all over and I'll share that later, but um, so the males will stay on. So I put up some nest boxes on the reserve and um, with one of my you know, theories was if they're triple, if they're having three nests or triple clutch, maybe they're nesting real low um, in you know, about 1500 feet and then they move up slope. Well, we're not seeing that. I'm, I'm getting uh, screech owls nest, um, but uh, some have been documented to have three clutches with three different males. So the female will have a clutch with one male, move to another nest, have another clutch and move to another nest. So incubation is about a month and um, a month till fledging. Till um, fledging when they leave the nest. So measurement. So sawwets show what's called a reverse dimorphism. So um, if you think about, you know, with mammals or at least humans, um, the male is generally larger. Um, well, it's just the opposite with, with Sawwet owls. The females are larger and they're up to 50% larger. So 
Our weight, the males range in weight from 65 to about 80 grams. And females will go about 80 grams, maybe a little bit less, up to 100 and let's well, say 151. The heaviest one that I caught was about um, 100, I think 106 grams. Um, so they're very different. I mean, if you can see, look at the, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but that one in the bottom left-hand corner, that's a male. And you can see how small it looks like a tennis ball. On, and this is a fully grown adult owl. Um, the males are a little bit bigger. And this next slide, look at how much bigger that one is. And that's a female. She's a fierce and fiery female. Um, that girl um, did some scratching and biting. Now it's not too, uh, too horrible, the scratches and bites, the little, little pricks, um, nothing, no big lacerations that need stitches, but you can kind of see their talons. And what's interesting about those talons is they just don't close and, and meet together. They actually will cross and they'll lock in on the prey. So this is one of their favorite items, um, a vole. And uh, this was as one night when I was actually checking nets, I could hear some scurrying and I went to look and that's one of their favorite foods. They also like um, mice. So deer mice, other mice that are found. Um, they're mostly, almost solely actually mammals. So some owls will do moths and small, but uh, sawwits, their, their prey, their food, their diet are mammals. Um, and you know, these voles are 50 grams and when they weigh 70 grams, that's, that's pretty impressive um, to eat something that size. So the name, um, the name, no one really knows for sure where the name Sawet, Sawet comes from. There's a French word that sounds like Sawet, which means little, little, little owl. Um, that sounds more likely. Another theory is of a wet stone, like a saw um, wet stone um, sharpening. Um, here's a couple of their vocals. So you can hear the male call. So we started by hearing the male call and that's what I play to lure the owls in. Here's some chirps, some barks, some wails. So nothing really uh, on those vocals uh, really sounded to me like a whetstone or sharpening. So I might lean more towards the, the, the idea that um, it comes from the French word, but you know, we don't know for sure. So we are part of Project Owlnet. And Project Owlnet is a group of, of uh, banders, owl banders across the country. And these dots represent a few, but not all of the stations. And you can see the East Coast has really good coverage in Canada. And we're a little bit thin in the West here. But uh, there's over 120, I think there's two, two something, 200 and something. Um, Scott Weisenthal um, is one of the key um, people that started the, the project and uh, we share methods, we share uh, data, we um, part of the Project Alnet, we communicate with each other and share stories. So it's uh, real important to have our data um, the similar methods and the same methods and the same protocol for calling, the same protocol for running the station. So that really helps our data. Um, migration habit, habit, habits, well, some stay near the breeding grounds. So we can see up in Canada, they do a lot of breeding. Our, they breed up in the northern part of uh, the Cascades, up, up, up slope, sorry, in the Cascades and the Sierras. And they will travel, you know, hundreds of miles. So these guys are really opportunists. So in a little bit, I'll share um, some of our successes. But these owls, they they don't follow a Pacific flyway like a, a goose would or a duck. Um, these are opportunists. They're going to where the food is. Now there's a mitochondrial DNA study of these guys and. What they found when they tested the West Coast and the East Coast and the Canadian and the you know, 
the middle part of America, they found no significant difference between the DNA, between those in the West uh, and those in the East and those in Canada and th those in the central part. So because there's no sig significant DNA differences, that would show that there is mixing, that they don't, um, they're all over. So, you know, maybe these East Coast aren't getting all the way to the West, but they're at least getting to the Midwest and the Midwest are getting to the West and there's crossing that way. So this is where I do my work. This is the Big Chico Creek Ecological Reserve. So it's just uphill from Chico. It's about um, for uh, about five or six miles up. It's just above Bidwell Park. So Bidwell Park, um, the property of Bidwell Park touches Big Chico Creek Ecological Reserve. Now you can't really see in that picture, but right at the very top is Mount Lassen, right as those um, canyons come together. And Mount Lassen, um, and this R reserve is fantastic because it acts like a funnel. So these birds that are moving south, they come into the Chico Creek Canyon, um, they're funneled from Mount Lassen and they, they come to us. So those that are migrating south. And migration season for us is around beginning of, of October to mid to late um, November. Um, so the reserve is part of Chico State Foundation and the foundation now is over 8,000 acres uh, of plan that they um, of, of property rather that they um, manage. So here's Highway 32. I have several owl stations. If you've ever been to the reserve, there is um, the barn and I do most of my banding on the Owl 3 station. So we'll see if this video shows. So we're setting up a series of nets. We have four nets up here today. We lay these four nets out. And then if you see over here, um, you can see there is a collar and that's a little speaker system that plays the call of a male, a northern solid owl. And uh, that collar brings the owls in and it'll bring them to the nets and then we'll retrieve them from the nets and bring them up to uh, process them. So when we set up the nets, what I do is, the nets are kind of particular in the way that we set them up, but you always have to make sure that this is on one side and this loop is on the other side. So I'm just going to stop there. We'll we'll talk more about the nets, but uh, that's just kind of the area um, where we're. Um, that's owl three, that station. So here's our net array. So what we have is we have the collar in the center, that blue ballpoint pen, um, net one, net two, net three, and net four. So we have a combination of 18 meter and um, uh, uh, 12 and 18 meter nets. So this is, these are some of the materials that I use for banding. So what we have is uh, the banding pliers, a gauge, a black light, um, a scale for weighing them, and um, a gauge for basically measuring the wing cord. So this is a little video. What I'm going to do is I'm going to skip it. Uh, did the, could you hear the last video? Was it okay? Thumbs up. Was it okay? Okay. So we'll play a little bit then. So this is our banding table, and here's some of the equipment that we use. We can see here's the banding pliers. That closes the bands on their legs. Here's a gauge for measuring the size of the leg. Um, a black light, and that's for illuminating the underside of the wing, which we'll talk about, and you'll see some pictures of it later. Um, a gauge or a ruler, basically for measuring um, the length of the wing cord, a scale for weighing it, and um, that's really about it, about the tools that we have. Okay, so here I have a, a couple guests that are uh, with us, and um, I'm kind of demonstrating the process of what's going on. I'm handling one of the owl, and um, we're up at the barn, so you can kind of see the processing part. So these are the bands that we use, and these are bands supplied by USGS, and these are a unique number. So you can see the little slit on them that opens up. It closes around their leg. It's, so it's a unique number. Um, no other uh, band has that number. So if you were to find a band or even a bird with a band on it, there's a little web address and a phone number that you can look it up and report it. And they'll give you a certificate. Congratulations, you have found this bird. 
It was banded here. It's a northern solid owl. It was banded here um, at this date by this person. And um, so those are the bands I use. And they're, they're called a, they're a size 4S. So they're a short um, because the tarsus the, on the leg, the leg is so short for a sawit, we need a little bit shorter band. And these are bands that are actually just made for sawit owls. So the band sizes, you can see the difference in the picture in the middle. Um, that's a male. Um, generally, males will use a 3A, size 3A or a 4S. Um, 4S's are pretty, pretty ubiquitous. We can pretty much use those for all uh, owls, sawets. Um, so I pretty much just use the 4S's. And then there's the larger female. And then when we do get Western screech owls, we use the five uh, locking, five locking. So the first step is I put a band on the leg and I'll, I'll show you that process in a little bit. So here's the nets. Um, and then the collar, you can see. And what they do is the owls will come, they'll hear that call, they'll be intrigued by the male, and they come to the net to, to see what's going on, uh, or they come towards the, the call, and they'll actually hit the net and kind of fall in the pocket. So you can see this top line, uh, there's like a little pocket. So they'll fall in that pocket, and then every 30 minutes, we'll go and extract them, and bring them up to the station, process them, and then let them go. So now that it's dark, you can really see the pockets that uh, the bird will fall into. Um, and you can also hear our collar. So up here in the distance, you can see the collar. So I use a different collar now. I, have, um, I was able to upgrade and get a uh, Fox Pro collar that has a remote control which is pretty convenient because what I can do is I can change the call um, from, from the banging table. And it's a little bit, it's waterproof and it's quite a bit more expensive, but uh, it's pretty, pretty reliable. So some of the data we collect. So of the data, now why are, why are we banding? Maybe I should have talked about this first. It's important to collect data um, for these owls. It's important to to understand these, these owls, to understand um, the habits, the breeding habit, habits, to know if they're increasing or decreasing, especially with climate change. Um, they are a species of concern because of where they breed. Um, they're gonna be pushed, rather than our foothills or the coastal range, they're gonna put, be pushed farther north as the, the uh, climate warms. So it's important that we have so much data. This the project Alnet has been going close to 20, 20 years. So you have a lot of data from these owls. And um, this is the data that, that we take. This is a, a banding sheet that's um, that a lot of the stations um, in Project Alnet do use. So sexing the owl. So first thing we do, we want to find out is it a male or female? Now the sex is determined by two measurements. One, the wing and the wing cord. And this is basically from the wrist to the tip of the wings. That's the wing cord measurement and the mass. So what we do is we put them in a little cup and weigh them. So I'm just looking at that scale and that owl is 90 grams. So that's probably a female um, because males pretty much stop. Um, you know, rarely will we see a male over Oh geez, 80, I think 88, if it's over 88, um, it's pretty much, it has to be uh, a female. So, or unknown. So we've got, we, to determine its sex, we use those two measurements. So what we do is we use this little chart and that chart, um, the wing cord is on the left of the chart and then the mass. So if the wing cord measurement was 135 and it was greater than 88, then it would be a female. But we do get a fair amount of unknown owls. Um, if it's 135 and less than 78, then it was a male. So um, that's how we determine its, uh, its sex. Now, how do we figure out how old it is? Well, Sawat owls are very elegant on how they do it. They're, it's just, uh, it's so beautiful how, um, how they molt. And what we do is we use molting, how they replace their feathers. So um, some birds will molt in a random pattern 
Sawets really molt in a very, uh, very elegant pattern. So a hatch here, well, let me back up. So the, what we used is these flight feathers. So the P10 through P1, this is called our primary flight feathers. So P1 through P10, and then S is secondary. So S1 through S13, these are the secondary flight feathers. Now the first year, an owl, um, if the owl was born in April, May, June, July, uh, August, and we get him in October, its flight feathers will all be the same age. And we call that a hatch year. So they're all fresh. And what, remember, if you remember in the uh, previous video, we had a black light. Um, we can tell when we look at the feather, the feather, feather color, the rachis, um, the darkness, the rachis is like the quill, and the dark of the feather, we can tell its age. Now, sometimes we get a little confused because some of these hatchier owls are very worn. They come to us, maybe they hatched in June or earlier and they've been very worn. So sometimes it's a challenge, but if we put a black light underneath the wing, um, the owls, these owls have chemicals in their wings that are called porphyrins and the porphyrins will illuminate um, to the black light. So I'll show you a comparison in the next owl, but with this owl, we can see that yes, it is a, um, it is a hatch year. And because um, all the feathers are the same age. Now, after the first year, then what they do is they start replacing the tips. So they replace the outer tips and then the, the uh, feathers near their body. So what you'll have is you'll have fresh feathers on the outside, and old feathers in the center. And that tells us, oh, well, this is a second year bird because it's got fresh tips and fresh near the body. And now that really kind of makes sense logically because if they're flying, they're gonna scratch their tips on trees and branches and maybe there's some wear near the body. So this would be a second year bird. And you see how the porphyrins illuminate. So the difference with this is look at how fresh the fresh feathers on the outside really, really illuminate with the black light. So we've got fresh and then we have old, okay? So if they're all the same, it's a hatch year. If we've got fresh on the outside and fresh near the body, it's a second year. And now third year or what we'll say more reliably is we'll say an after second year. After that second year, what they do is now they just molt as needed. So it'll be much more random. So we can accurately measure the owl's age for about three years, two years really, and then third. So we know that their first year or second year, and then an after third year. Um, and you can see this owl here, and this one's really good because you can see these fresh feathers here, they're very dark. And look at these very old feathers. They're very like, um, brownish rufous, kind of almost reddish copper colored. Um, and then we have some old feathers here. So there's three generations of feathers on this owl. So that would, we would call that owl an after second year. So we know its sex by its mass and the length, the wing cord. Now we can figure out its age by how it molts its feathers. Uh, so look at the black light here. So what we can see is we can see fresh, we can see old, this feather here, is very old and there's another very old and then um, we can see the difference here. So we can see three generations with a black light. Now once we get, um, we've sexed it, we've figured out how old it is, we bring it up to the, uh, well we brought it up to the banding table already and let me just show you a part of this clip. Band. Now when it's time to open up a band, what I do is I line up that little slice with the pliers here and then I open it up, put the string aside, and then I put the band in the plier, in the pliers, I guess. Okay, so uh, I prepare the band ahead of time, then I'll take the owl out. So now I'm in the process, I'm going to take this owl out of, uh, of the bag. <clears throat> okay, so I've got an owl in the bag here. So I'm going to feel through the bag, just if I can see which way he's facing. It looks like so he's facing this way, his eyes are looking, and that's where his bill is. So I'm going to come in behind him, 
and then hold him <clears throat> in what we call the banders grip. So I'm holding the wings down. And I'm gonna slide him out. And there you go, right there. Okay. Sweet little guy. This is a northern sawwet owl. Okay, so first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a band on his leg. <clears throat> I'm going to hold the leg out. I've already got the band in the pliers. So I'm going to hold it with these little pinkies. And then I just close a little bit. And I'll roll it so we don't get feathers stuck in there. And then I open it up. You can see a few feathers in here. So then I just roll it through here. <clears throat> and I'm going to come at it one more time at a different angle with pliers and close it up completely. Okay, now it's closed completely. <clears throat> so the next thing I'm going to do, yep, that looks good. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get its wing cord. So I'm going to get the measurement of the wing from basically the wrist to the tip of the wing. Let me scoot over here. <clears throat> So I put the gauge underneath the wing and I elevate it and I lift it up, tuck it here. I lift it up so it's not laying flat. I want to keep a natural curve. So it looks like it's about 140. Okay. <clears throat> so the wing cord is 140. I look at its tail and it looks like there are three bars of feathers on the tail, so three tail bars. And then I'll look and um, see the age of the feathers. And this looks like it's a hatchier to me that they're all the same color and same age. Yeah. This could be fresh. So what I'll do is I will look with a black light. And sometimes it's a little bit harder. So I'm going to protect its eyes. So it can't, you know, doesn't damage it, but I'm going to look. Yeah, and the feathers are all the same color. So, so it's a hatchery bird. That is right. And there's the color underneath the wing. It's called porphyrin. It's a chemical in the wing that will kind of oxidize and age. So he's a hatchery because it's, his feathers are all the same age. It was a little bit hard to tell here and here. These look really fresh, but. Looks like it's a hatch here. Okay, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to weigh him. Put him in the cup here. The scale is zeroed out. I tuck its wings in here. I'm going to hold its legs just to keep them calm. And 82.9. So it's kind of light. The range is from about 70 to like 105, 75 to 105. And uh, if you can zoom in on his face, you can kind of see, especially if I don't put quite so much light in there, beautiful colors. And they're a magnificent creature. The Northern Sawyer. Sometimes when they're really agitated, we'll pet them and that'll kind of calm them down. As you can see, he's not stressed out. He's pretty calm, just letting us do what we need to do. So this is a northern solid owl. So as you saw with the video, they weren't too stressed out. Um, you know, number one priority for these owls is the safety. So uh, they're in the net. We like to get them processed and have collect the data and release them in 15 minutes or so. So um, and then frequently they'll, we'll release them in a tree, they'll go up and they might yell at us and bark and, you know, chirp and squeal at us um, throughout uh, the night and sometimes they'll, they'll move on. So um, the age and number of owls and fall, fall migration. So what we have is this is our data from, um, this is last year's data, but not this year's data, but you can see that there are trends and they tend to go into four year cycles. 
Now, how do we know if it's a really good year, if there's a lot of owls? Well, on this graph, I've got uh, this year's data on this graph in 2021 here. Um, so our number, and this is owls captured per 100 net, owl, net hours. So what we know is that in the 2026 or 2017, what we had is you know 26 owls. So that's really good. Um, and then 2020 was four years later, so that was a low. And then this year we're starting to go back up. So and next year it'll be a little bit more. Um, interesting thing about this graph, as you can see, when I went back, is what we've got after hatch years. The Look at this hatch year in 2017. There's a lot of hatch year and a few after hatch year. So the next year, it's about 50-50. And the next year, there's less hatch years. So um, those numbers, the, the, the balance of hatch year to after hatch year changes. So last year was an OK year. It wasn't the slowest, um, but it was, it was a pretty good year. Now. Why do we do this? Well, another, in addition to collecting data that we send off to USGS, um, banders, when we get a recapture, an owl that was banded at another site, or an owl, when someone captures one of ours, that is just like super, super thrilling when we do it. Now, we've had three foreign recoveries. We've had three owls. Uh, we've caught three owls that have been banded at other sites. So our first one, was banded in Western Montana. And you can see this one arrow here in Montana. That was banded at the Owl Research Institute in Bitterroot Valley. Um, he was banded and 35 days later, he flew to us. So he didn't go straight directly south. He crossed, he crossed the, uh, the Sierras and in 35 days. And that's you know, over 700 miles. So that's pretty, pretty impressive to travel that far uh, in 35 days. Our next one was Hitchcock Nature Center in Iowa. So this Iowa bird came to us, probably bred up in Canada, came down to Iowa, was banded. Um, and I think it was banded as a hatch year, maybe went back up to Canada and then came down the coast the next year. So it was a year later that he came to us. Um, and then the, um, the last one that we captured from another was Cobble Hill, British Columbia. And that was just um, in 2018, so a couple of years ago. Now, two of our owls have been captured by another banning site. And the Rocky Point Bird Observatory over on Victoria Island, it's right in the, it's in Canada, and it's right in the Juan de Fuca Strait, which acts kind of like a funnel. They've caught two of our owls. And in actually in one year, they got two of our owls. And it was that year in 2018 um, that they that we banded it. And the next year it came up to them. So the enrich, originally Dawn uh, Garcia put the station up because she wanted to prove her, her hypothesis that there was uh, some north-south movement. So yes, we've seen her uh, by putting up our station in California. Yes, we've seen north-south movement, but we've also seen east-west movement. So it's just, it's yes and no. So it's confirmed her hypothesis that it's north-south, but we also see that some east-west um, movement of these owls. Now, if, as I mentioned, if you ever catch an owl or another bird that has a ban, you call it in, you share that information with US, USGS, and they give you a, a neat little, um, a certificate that you can frame. Now, in addition to doing owls, um, sawwets um, and the seasonal, um, the, the fall migration, I also do some work in the spring and winter. We see that our owls do winter with us. They do, but in smaller quantities. So we don't exactly know where, know where these guys are going. We know they come through, a few stay in the reserve, but most move off. And uh, we do some spring banding. And then I also have put up some nest boxes. And the nest boxes are to see if they do uh, use a reserve. And a reserve is around 1,700 feet in elevation. So uh, right now, the nest boxes, it's kind of showing that um, they, they don't use it. Uh, but we do get screech owls. So I also place nest boxes in Plumas National Forest, um, but no owls yet. 
um, we get screech owls. Now this mama has nested in the same box. And I, I know that because I banded her the first year and she has nested in this box for five years in a row, the same mama. So um, this year she produced five, uh, four. Um, uh, and then this is one of the first years. One year was two, another year was five, another year is four. So this same mama has produced, and she's a screech owl, so she's produced quite a few owls, owlets. Um, here are some of the babies just waiting to get banned. You can see that's an adult Western screech owl. And um, I, I am licensed to, to ban owls, screech owls also. So I take the opportunity to, um, to record the data for these guys too. Now, not only do we get owls nesting in our boxes, sometimes we get flying squirrels. And this is a Humboldt flying squirrel. So um, we catch flying squirrels in nets. Um, usually early in the season, um, they tend to, to come to the net. I was checking one of my nest boxes and out scurried this little squirrel. And you can see kind of the flap between its front legs. Um, and I had a, a camera on a pole and you can see the pole there, a little GoPro. And I, I'm reaching around. So I'm on the other side, so you can see my hand here. And I took a picture of him there. So that's a, a Humboldt flying squirrel. So sometimes they do get in the net. There is a little baby one that got caught in the net. Every other year, I'll get a flying squirrel. Um, my first year that I caught, I captured a flying squirrel. I was so excited. I was, I was jumping up and down excited because, you know, when I was a kid in the 70s, I remember reading, you know, Ranger Rick. And um, Ranger Rick had stories about flying squirrels. And I always, well, you know, the stories were amazing. And I, you know, didn't realize that California had them. And we do have them here. So we can see one that's a bigger, an adult one that's uh, captured. I don't like um, capturing mammals. It's, it's not my goal. Um, they're a little hard to get out sometimes. Um, and you can see, here's a process of me getting one out. Now this one isn't very tangled at all. I'm holding him by the scruff of the neck like a, like a kitten. And I'm seeing that he's basically just holding the neck. So, so I'm going to spread it out kind of like a cat's cradle. Now watch, he's going to jump to the ground and watch what happens when he jumps to the ground. Now watch this. Boing, boing. So it's pretty delightful how they move on the ground with uh, jumping. So I get flying squirrels, and there's a flying squirrel nest. I get ash-throated flycatchers in my nest boxes. And then sometimes we get these bats, and these are called pallid bats. Um, but this year, I got a pallid bat in my uh, nets. And uh, we get them because they fly close to the ground. So pallid bats really love those Jerusalem crickets. And uh, so they'll actually go onto the ground and eat those. And when, uh, when they're flying close to the ground, they will turn off their sonar. And um, maybe that's one of the reasons why we do catch them. Only within the first two weeks, you know, by in October, we'll catch. I don't think I've ever caught one, a bat in November. So they probably are moving on. And you can see here's a video of uh, bats. When they're on the ground, they can't take off because their wings are flat on the ground. So they have to climb up a tree to take off. So a bird can lift its wings up above its head and bring it down. But look what the bats do. So now it can take off. Now, I've not caught a, um, a ring-tailed cat, but uh, one night when we were banding, waiting for um, the, the next net run, we heard some scurrying, some turkeys in this tree. So we all went out with our lights and then we saw this uh, ringtail cat just in the tree. Um, this next one is a video. You can see the ringtail cat jump. So they are in the area. There's a lot of uh, mountain lions in the area, bears um, on the reserve. So the reserve is full of wildlife. So every owl has a different personality. Um, a different look to them. 
This one on the left is very alert and bright. They have a, they, they all look different, believe it or not. These owls have a different look. This one on the left is kind of bright and some of them are fiery. This one that uh, Erica is holding and the one in the left picture on the lower one, it's a really different kind of squinty eye, um, kind of a goofy looking owl here. So they do have uh, a different appearance. So here's some of our, um, uh, well, we can see some of our my banders. We can see Dawn, this is who started the station and um, Erica, I've sub-permitted her. Uh, Julia sub-permitted her and Wyatt, I sub-permitted them. So they're working for with me in the station. And, um, and this is Carol, she's worked with me for years and she brought uh, one of my students actually this year came up, uh, her grandson, kind of adopted grandson. So sawwits have a very different look than a screech owl. This is what a sawwit baby looks like. So I still have not held a sawwit baby. Um, they're just downy. There's barely any um, flight feathers. I don't think there's any flight feathers on this guy, well, maybe a few. So that's what my, uh, the sawwit owls look like when they're babies. So hopefully, I will get to work with them. So there is my presentation. So I'm back here. So questions? Okay. Well, so far, the only question is, I guess going back to the chart, someone asked what happened in 2013. Oh, yes, you notice that. In 2013, we had an accident at the reserve. So there was a deck and um, that people were on a, taking a photograph from the, on the deck and the deck collapsed. So some people got seriously injured. So the station was closed and the reserve was closed to people. So we were able to work, but we had to cross. Um, we had to open up a new station near the road and we basically had to walk across. We couldn't drive on. So that's why um, um, we had very limited. I think we only got nine or something like that out. So not very many that one year. So that's why it's important to have a lot of data. You know, we our station's been uh, open the 17 years. So we have a lot of data. Um, I think our numbers are up to 1300 owls. We've uh, banded in, um, at our station. And of those 1300 owls, only two have been recaptured. So there's, there's a lot of owls out there and uh, the mortality is pretty high. You know, if you think of if one female can um, have a clutch of three to six eggs and sometimes multiple clutches, um, you know, she might produce three to 10 eggs in a, in a year, um, they all die. Um, you know, they don't make it, um, you know, most of them will die. So uh, what preys on them is the um, sometimes great horn owls, but frequently those dirty barred owls. So on the East Coast, they have a really difficult time that barred owls will wait near the nests, near the net, sorry. And even in um, Washington and British Columbia, the barred owls will wait near the net. And when one flies in the net, the barred owl will go and take its lunch. So they have to do things to, to keep those barred owls away. So um, we had, I had one barred owl uh, detection this year. I could, he I heard it our first, and then actually we had a barred owl in Bidwell Park. So they're starting to move down. So um, hopefully we can slow that down a little bit because barred owls, um, you know, they're not supposed to be here if you're not familiar with barred owls. Um, they're uh, kind of an Eastern, uh, Midwest owl that's range is expanding and um, they're um, kind of out competing our, um, our spotted owl. Um, they, they use the same habitat, they're out competing and they're more aggressive than spotted owls. So um, barred owls are, they're beautiful, but um, very different personality too. Uh, our barred owls are very feisty and spot owls are spotted are much more relaxed and calmer. So that could be another one of the reasons. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's another question uh, referring to a comment you made uh, in one of the videos about the number of bars on the tail feathers. And the question is, what what do the number of bars mean? So right. What does that now, indicate? 
Yeah, no, good question. Yeah, right now what we're doing is we don't know. So this is data that some of the Project Alnet um, uh, banders are are recording, and um, someone needs to write their their master's thesis or doctor's thesis on that because um, we got plenty of research, we got plenty of data collected, but we really don't know. And we know that um, you know there are some traits, even eye colors. Um, some are very yellow, bright, and some are more darker orange. So. Still data, we don't know. It's a variation that we collect. Okay. <clears throat> Another question is with the global warming climate change, what can we as individuals do to help preserve habitat uh, now species in this instance? What, preserve habitat, especially for owl species. Yeah, well, you know, that good question. I think one of the things that we can do is do our part to slow it down, you know, solar, uh, recycling, use less energy, um, but also support organizations like Audubon. Um, some of the stuff that I really didn't know, some of the amazing things that we do to protect habitat um, as an organization. Um, you know, I'm quite proud to be part of Audubon. There's other great organizations that are doing things to protect habitat, to restore habitat, um, you know, supporting them, volunteering, um, and, you know, even volunteering at a banding station. Um, that's one way that you can help, and it's kind of fun, too. So are there jobs for uh, uh, non-banders at the station? Yeah, you know, I am, I always, I have a couple people um, that I have, um, I've supplemented to help, and if I've supplemented them, then I don't have to be there. So our station is open up six days a week. I work three days a week after school and I got to get up early the next morning. Um, but there are scribes, there are people that can record data that can help. And then I, you know, when people come up, I start teaching them the skills and handling. So, um, you know, you start slow, um, and especially students, you know, I, I like all people to work, I like to work with all people. Um, but I, I really show a preference to students who um, are studying uh, the biological sciences and that for a resume, you know, um, I'm going to be submitting to probably next year, two students that have worked really well with me and to, on their resume, that'll be a fantastic thing to have that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> a question about your funding source. Uh, what is your main funding source? So we're funded through AltaCal Audubon um, donations. Um, we have these really um, neat shirts that we sell, um, but we also had a bequest um, that someone left to us. So add Audubon to your will for a bequest. And this is helping um, our research and education. And a third of the bequest is, um, is geared for education and um, research. So. Um, it's, it's amazing having that, that, okay. that funding source. Okay. Uh, oh, the screen keeps moving on. There we go. Uh, what habitat do solid owls use in the winter? So there's so much we don't know about these guys. We don't know where they come from. We don't know where they go. I mean, we have general ideas, but, um, you know, ducks and geese are really easy, you know? The Lucian Islands, and they come, you know, um, but these guys are coming from all over. So we know that some use the reserve. Um, I have a colleague in, um, in Blue Lakes in Mendocino County, and she just opened up a station and she's seen some year round and that some migratory ones, so some are coming through and some stay. So I have another colleague that opened up, uh, is opening up a station, opened up a station in um, Mount Diablo area. Um, she's seen a lot less owls in that area, so they're maybe they're crossing the Golden Gate and they not going to the Mount Diablo. She's seen significantly less numbers. Um, and then I have um, uh, so a couple people worked with me this year that are in Grass Valley, Audubon there, and they're talking about opening up a station there. Um, they have a map station and uh, a teacher at one of the colleges there, two teachers, and they want to open up a station there. So we need to collect so much more data. We know that they winter in the lower elevations on the reserve and the foothills, um, but 
you know, that's about all, you know, we don't know exactly. Um, one of the things that we have some funding that um, there is a, a MOTIS, there is a, uh, a, a radio collar, radio frequency, it's not a collar, but it's like a backpack. And we're, we're hoping to put one of these stations up. So if an owl were to fly by or any other bird that has one of these, it would ping and re download all the data to our station. So um, that's another thing that we need funding for that the reserve is gonna pay for half of the funding and then Altical is gonna pay for the rest. Um, and it would be really great to collect that data. I know there's it's um, uh, several other um, areas are opening up those. It's, it's just like a radio tower. And mm -hmm. uh, the data downloads to the tower from when the owl flies by. So it's it's it really doesn't matter what the frequency is. The receiving stations uh, can pick up. I mean, it, they're not tuned to just a, a particular transmitter. Then the yeah, I think receiver. yeah, I think they have a range, right? They have uh -huh. a range that a frequency that, that I'm sure they're locked in and can use. And uh, these stations will actually even um, for butterflies. There are some of the tags are very small that will just fit on the, the wing of a butterfly. Now, I'm not sure you would use a, a, a migrating butterfly, but maybe even local butterflies that are in the area. I'm not sure you'd want to burden, um, but you know, a gram or not even a half a gram, I'm not even sure the, the weight of some of these uh, radio transmitters. It has a little solar cell on there and it sends a, a signal and the station picks it up. So it knows a GPS location and a time for these animals, owls, bugs. So it's pretty interesting. We're, we're hoping to get that up by next year. Wow. Lots of questions. Um, go ahead, what'd you say? There's so much we don't know about these owls. Oh. Even though they're the most studied owl. Um, mm -hmm. There's so much we still don't know about. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I had, uh, you hear about Scott Widensoul? Yes. Is, is he, is some of his work, is that part of the Owl Net project? Yes. Owl project Net, project yeah. Owl Net? Yeah, he Do was. You collaborate with other groups across the country? Yes, yeah, he was one of the founders. He started in Pennsylvania. He's come out to, to our station and uh, um, spoke at the Snow Goose Festival years ago and came to our station and now he's i think he's moved to new hampshire maybe yeah i think new hampshire and he has another station there but he mm -hmm. actually literally wrote the book on owls so i have a book on owls and he wrote it so <laughs> and so in <clears throat> in chatting with other of stations similar stations uh, you talk about techniques you talk about uh, experiences with weather and, and different habitat types is that useful to you oh to yeah station? yeah definitely it's it's a, a closed group um like a listserv group that's open only to to licensed banders but you know definitely our techniques how do we keep keep these barred owls away or um uh techniques for banding or um sharing information about um uh, parasites or you know it's and it's very rewarding to, to be in that group and just to share, well, this year I got, uh, you know, we got 96 owls this year, you know. Um, in 2017, I got 180 owls. So, you know, it's a lower year, but we were out less nights too. So just sharing that information, it's very rewarding to work um, with other colleagues, distant even. Great. That seems to be the question. I'm going to go towards the front, see if I missed any. Uh, Ken, I was just going to say one thing that uh, uh, that Ken, the speaker, mentioned to us before we uh, went live with everybody is the Snow Goose Festival, some of you may know, is coming right up. And the, the bad news for those of us who didn't sign up sooner is it's completely sold out. And uh, one of the reasons being that uh, they've made their field trips smaller, right, Ken? They don't have as many people on them. So... Hopefully things will get back to normal by next year and uh, we'll come see you. Yeah. Yeah, I have a field trip that sold out in like 20 minutes or 40 minutes or something like this where um, we're doing banding, um, some winter survey. So hopefully we can get one or two owls um, and we usually get one or two. I, if I don't get any saw wets, what I'll do is I'll call for screech owls 
<laughs> and I can get I can get a, at least get a Western Screech Owl in. They respond really <laughs> well to a call. Uh, <clears throat> so there are several thanks uh, for your speaking tonight. Uh, appreciation of your experience and knowledge and caring. Uh, <clears throat> kudos for looking at the, the modus tool. Uh, but mostly um, that's the questions and uh, but uh, folks are appreciative as am I of uh, your taking the time to to share your your research and experiences with us here. It's, I found it very um, enjoyable and exciting. Okay. Maybe one day one will land on my back fence and I'll say, oh, there it is. <laughs> okay. So, um, you so much. you can't. Uh, and Anne, before we go, did you want to, if you're looking at the chat, there's a couple of sightings of burrowing owls. And yeah, that was like a comment on that. Marnell uh, was glad to see a burrowing owl uh, this year. She said she hadn't seen one in, in uh, several years. And, and uh, uh, Neely also mentioned that they used to be much more prevalent in Davis. And that's that's certainly true. They're hard to find now. and. Uh, and when some of us do see them, we tend not to mention where we've seen them because we don't want, I'm a photographer, we don't want overzealous photographers showing up and sticking their lens down the burrow, which believe me has happened. So, yeah. Uh, but I'm glad, Marnell, that you got to see an owl. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I agree about the 70s. I, I found an old. <clears throat> print of uh, when they used to time stamp, date stamp the print, 1973, a burrowing out out on road 29 before they, or 28H before they realigned it. But uh, yeah, those were the days. So well, folks, I want to thank you all uh, for uh, joining us tonight. And um, no more questions. Uh, and Ken, I want to thank you very much for uh, your talk tonight. I really appreciate it uh, that you took the time and it was uh, uh, very intriguing, very intriguing the, the, that there are, I mean, you said they're the most numerous owl or very numerous owl. You talk about being secretive. So <laughs> anyway, thank you folks. Uh, that's it for the night, Ken. Thank you for joining us and, and we're done. <laughs> we're gonna. You know, in my notes, in, in the chat, I have a direct message from Tanya that they were able to get one of those tickets to the Snow Goose. So Tanya, we'll, we'll see you at the Snow Goose Festival if you're still on. <laughs> yeah, we'll see you there. <laughs> I'm super excited. Congratulations. Yeah, hopefully we'll get one. Hopefully we'll yeah. get one. Awesome. Thanks, Ken. Good night, Thank everybody. You. Good night. Thank you.